Now, a special edition of America's Most Wanted, a Jean Benet update on Fox. Each week, we ask you to help us find justice after a crime takes place. Well, later tonight, we're going to do something a little different. Every person watching will have the chance to get involved and save a life before it's too late. A group of celebrities has gathered here in San Francisco for a very important cause. And you can join them from your own home. So don't go away, because tonight, we need you more than ever. Tonight on America's Most Wanted, America Fights Back. A special report on the mysterious death of Jean Benet Ramsey. What do the friends know? John and Patsy didn't have anything to do with killing the little girl. What does the family know? Patsy and John have an insight as to what happened. What have the police uncovered? With crossing their teeth and dotting their eyes, the police know who killed the child. The nation's top crime experts come together to piece together what happened to Jean Benet. Uh, you don't write a ransom list when you kill the kid and leave her in the basement. Leave her in the basement. Also tonight, cops say this man created one obsession. He is a neat freak. <laughs> everything is lined up, everything. For another. There's a large degree of overkill in this homicide. What turned a former honor student into a cold-blooded thrill killer? As they were running away, they were laughing and sounded real evil. And the stars of the NFL team up with America's Most Wanted for the sake of a little girl. If I could do anything to help people, you know, take the test to maybe be a match to save a life, I'll do it. Tonight, football great Charles Haley is fighting to save his daughter's life, and he's turning to you, because tonight, America's Most Wanted is where America fights back. Now, from San Francisco, John Walsh. Good evening. We're in San Francisco for this year's forensic conference, the nation's top scientific detectives have gathered here. Later on, we're going to ask them to help solve the country's number one case, the unsolved murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. But first, we want to announce the latest addition to the FBI's top 10 list. It's a story that's a nightmare for any parent. Imagine one day your kid's a straight A student, and the next day, he's the most wanted man in America. What would you do? In this case, the young man's parents bailed him out. But when they found out just how much trouble he'd gotten into, they agreed to help us track him down. Las Vegas, Nevada, May 26, 1996. Come on, kid. Open the gate. In the early morning hours, three men forced their way into a gun shop. Come on, let's go. Police say it was an ambitious break-in, the kind usually attempted only by experienced burglars looking for a big score. Police say the gang took nearly 70 firearms, which police believe they planned to sell for a hefty profit. Come on, baby, let's make moves, man. Let's make moves. No! Is that it? Police say the thieves were 27-year-old yeah. Troy Sampson, 22-year-old Edward Gregory James, and 21-year-old Tony Amati, a former high school honor student. He was a straight-A student, graduated with honors, so he's a good kid. He goes to school, come home, do his homework. Uh, his math and stuff, he was excellent in math. Good morning, Mr. Jenny Guy. I'm going to tell you that you have absolutely, definitely won one of four fabulous prizes. Amadi got his first taste of easy money working for a telemarketing firm that police say operated barely within the law. And while still in high school, Amadi was making upwards of $4,000 a week. It's called Feed the Children. What have you got to lose? You know you won a one of a kind 14 karat gold bracelet. Is a starving child's life worth a few hundred dollars? You just give me a credit card number and you find out immediately which price you want. Tony was probably better than a banker at managing money. He was excellent. All his bills were paid on time. He had credit cards more than me and my husband ever had and kept the payments right up to date. 
By the time Amati was 19, he had bought himself a car and a house. He asked his girlfriend, Mia Burkhalter, to move in with him. That's when Mia really found out just how meticulous Amati was. Yeah, made in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> he is a neat freak. <laughs> neat freak. Everything he does is irritating me. His box score. <laughs> lined up perfect. Everything is lined up. Everything. How's that? Good. Hey, Mia, come on. I just get this in. It irritated me real bad. You were afraid to touch anything. You can touch his remote control, and as soon as you get up, he's going to take his remote control, and he's going to clean it. When he get out the shower, he'll take a piece of toilet paper and dry up the water that's like on the door. He does everything he does. It's just crazy, neat, crazy. It's sleeping with the enemy, neat. <laughs> if Mia was sleeping with the enemy, Amadi was staying awake with a dangerous element. Troy Sampson, also known as T, was a 27-year-old ex-con whom Amadi had admired. Marty soon adopted Samson's gangster mentality. Tony never got in trouble with the law until he met T. You know, him and T get together, and I don't know, maybe T was putting things in his head. Hey, man, you could do this if you bad, or you could do this, or we could do this. And then Tony was like, you're right, you're right, we can, especially when it comes to money. Tony Amati's a rather intelligent young man, but he fancies himself... Um, a mobster in one aspect, that he wants to be involved in criminal activities such as organized rooftop gun store burglaries and or trafficking in narcotics. On May 27, 1996, just one day after the gun store robbery, police say the group decided to try out their new weapons. Police say their target was Michael Mauda, who was collecting cans and bottles behind an apartment around 4 a.m. large degree of overkill in this homicide. Perhaps they thought nobody would miss him or anybody would, nobody would care about his death. You know, I mean, working for this telemarketing company. Police say Amadi's parents had no idea their son was now a cold-blooded killer. Uh, I'm gonna open up my own place. On July 27th, 1996, two months after police say the group gunned down Michael Mata, Amadi and his cohort struck again. 49-year-old John Garcia, had also been murdered in what police called a complete overkill shooting. He again was shot uh, multiple times by multiple weapons. There's absolutely no motive that we can determine in this murder either. Less than one month later, at another Las Vegas apartment complex, 22-year-old Keith Dyer was walking his co-worker, Stacy Dooley, home from work. I was working at Pizza Hut, and Keith came and picked me up and gave me a ride home, and we parked in my parking spot and walked through the little walkway to my apartment. I saw three men wearing all black and they had a gun out and it had the, a little bit red laser light on it. No, break yourself. They said break yourself. I didn't know what break yourself meant. I said break yourself. Then I saw him put a light on Keith. kept firing and the mud and everything was flying up in the air. I turned as they were running away. They were laughing and sounded real evil. Police say Stacy was very lucky. She escaped with only one bullet wound to her leg, but Keith Dyer hit multiple times, died instantly. Somebody call a doctor! Oh. On October 3rd, 1996, Amadi, Samson, and James were arrested when they tried to sell several of their stolen weapons to undercover detectives. The police quickly executed a search of Amadi's home, where they recovered several dozen guns that came from the gun store burglary. 
And in Amati's nightstand was the handgun with the laser sight. Ballistics testing would later determine that it had been used in all three murders. But before those test results had come in, Tony Amati posted bail and fled. We don't know what happened. We have no idea. He just, uh, he went into, this is a profession, I guess, for him. And it's a, uh, it's a setting we don't even understand. I don't begin to try to understand. The lifestyle, I'm... what he's doing, we don't understand it. I guess I was just really blind to a lot of it. And I thought that my son would have better sense than that and see what was ahead of him. But it was just the glamour and the money. Police say Tony Amati wants to be a young lord of the underworld. As you saw, he's obsessed with neatness. Amati's charged with murder in the three cold-blooded thrill killings and is considered armed and extremely dangerous. Police believe Amati may be in Florida or possibly Illinois, where he has family. Please, if you've seen Tony Amati, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now, we've been following the bombing of the abortion clinic in Alabama. Tonight, we've got the latest. As you probably know by now, a man was killed in that blast. And once again, we have to take a stand against any kind of homegrown terrorism. The images are painfully familiar. A year ago, two bombs explode outside an Atlanta clinic. In Boston, an anti-abortion activist goes on a rampage, killing two women. Pensacola, Florida. A doctor is gunned down outside a clinic. In the same city a year later, another doctor and security guard are fatally shot. Violence at abortion clinics has become a scourge on cities in the U.S. Last month, it reached its ugly hand into Birmingham, Alabama, the new woman, all women, health care clinic. A fatal bombing. Robert Sanderson, an off-duty police officer, was killed in the blast. And the nurse opening the clinic, Emily Lyons, was severely injured. Investigators have pieced together the awful moments of that morning. The explosive device was placed in the area here. Apparently, Officer Sanderson approached to investigate. And when the device detonated, he was flung back into this corner. The bomb was full of nails. The nails flew back here toward the front of the clinic and uh, struck Emily Lyon. Ironically, the victim, Officer Robert Sanderson, was not a supporter of abortion. He was moonlighting and just doing his job. He wasn't there for pro-choice or for pro-life. He was there enforcing the law. Officer Sanderson died on the eve of the Olympics in Nagano, Japan, a poignant reminder of one of his most thrilling moments in 1996. He was nominated as a uh, torchbearer, Olympic torchbearer for our area here when the Olympics were in town, and, and uh, I'm really proud of him for that. He deserved it. I really hadn't hit me yet to, that, he's, that he's not going to be there. I didn't want to believe it was him, didn't want to believe that it had happened to, to somebody so close to me. The nurse injured that morning, Emily Lyons, is in the hospital, slowly recovering from severe shrapnel wounds, including one that claimed her left eye. Emily is my life, so whoever did this First of all, tried to murder my wife. They also tried to murder me or take away the most important thing in my life. Keeping the faith alive is Emily's husband, Jeff, a computer programmer who took his talents to cyberspace and created this homepage for Emily's friends to follow her progress. I wanted to make sure that Emily had a support mechanism and I also wanted to update a lot of people uh, easily at the same time. Amazingly, in the chaos surrounding the blast, three witnesses managed to spot a pickup truck pulling away from the scene. The license plate led agents to this man, 31-year-old Eric Robert Rudolph, a recluse from the rugged mountains of North Carolina. Agents now believe he's the madman behind the bombing. From Birmingham, Alabama, police say Rudolph drove the pickup truck back to the town he's been living in, Murphy, North Carolina. Investigators found the truck not far from Rudolph's home but Rudolph's trail had gone cold. We're still pursuing leads uh, across the southeast predominantly, uh, still running down leads here in the Birmingham area. Uh, so we're, we're working very vigorously to try to locate Mr. Rudolph. Investigators want to stop Rudolph before he takes his rage out on more innocent victims. The families of Officer Sanderson and Emily Lyons say time is of the essence. I don't want someone else's wife 
to be in the same shape that Emily is. If this person is not caught, this will happen again. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Help stop the violence and help find Eric Rudolph. He's been charged with using an explosive device and with the death of Robert Sanderson. If you've seen Eric Rudolph, or if you have any information about the Birmingham abortion clinic bombing, call us now at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Up next, like mother? Miss West Virginia 1977, Patsy Paul Ramsey. Like daughter? But when the daughter dies, the mother lives under a cloud of suspicion. So what is the truth? The stage front. It's a stage event. Right. Well, you well look at the note. Tonight, secret evidence police have known all along. And later, baseball's Barry Bonds pitches in with Joe Montana and Johnny Cochran for a life and death cause. We need to pull together and get everyone together to save our lives. Find out how you can be a hero also, as America's Most Wanted continues from San Francisco. The most talked about case in the nation is the murder of little Jean Benet Ramsey. After 14 months, police have still not found her killer. But now new information is beginning to surface. And that case that once seemed unsolvable may now be nearing a conclusion. What happened to the six year old who wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps as a beauty queen? 1977, Patsy Paul Ramsey. You say neither, and I say neither, 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 let's all the whole thing on. Who could have killed this pretty little girl with seemingly no enemies? Boulder police are running through a checklist of 80 items they hope will help them single out the killer. At this point, they're eliminating. They're crossing their T's and dotting their I's and trying to explain all kinds of little things inside that house, and there were hundreds of them, so that when they go after this person, there'll be no question that this person did it and this person will be charged and brought to trial. Things like a specific phrase from the ransom note, a mysterious blue fiber found on Jean Bonnet's body, and something as simple as pineapple could finally help police crack this case. First, here's the Ramsey's account of Christmas night, 1996. John and Patsy Ramsey returned home from a Christmas party with Jean Benet and her brother Burke sometime after 9 p.m. Patsy Ramsey says Jean Benet was already asleep when they got home, so she put Jean Benet to bed in the same clothes she wore to the party. Sometime between bedtime and dawn, Jean Benet was murdered. According to the autopsy report, the cause of death was strangulation after suffering a severe blow to the head. The blow itself would have been capable of causing her death, uh, but it didn't. Uh, she was strangled before it, it killed her. Mrs. Ramsey says she woke up before dawn the next morning, discovered the ransom note on the spiral staircase, claiming Jean Bonnet had been kidnapped. By 7 a.m., police were in the house working the case and waiting for the kidnapper's call. Police told John Ramsey to check the house to see if anything had been disturbed. Ramsey, accompanied by family friend Fleet White Jr., went right to the basement. He opened one door. There, in a seldom used room, he found Jean Benet's body. As is often the case when a child is killed inside the home, the parents, John and Patsy Ramsey, were among the first to be placed under an umbrella of suspicion. I did not kill my daughter, John Bonet. I did not have anything to do with it. Despite public suspicions, the Ramseys maintained their innocence from the start, and inexperienced Boulder police were criticized for running a sloppy investigation. But nearly 14 months after Jean Bonet was killed, the Ramseys are still a focus of the police investigation. And now, some of the people who knew them best are beginning to wonder. I'll tell you, there are a lot of people out there who are more and more suspicious the longer this goes on. Fox News Channel correspondent Carol McKinley has been covering this case since the beginning. She learned the police are trying to piece together a psychological profile of Patsy by re-interviewing Ramsey family friends. 
What they are hearing paints an interesting picture of Patsy as a charming yet controlling woman. They're both strong, but that she is not uh, some withering magnolia, that she is a very strong woman. McKinley says the single most important piece of evidence may be the ransom note. It's got handwriting on it. It's got no prints. Whoever wrote that note wore gloves. So you've got to look at things like linguistics, at phrasing, at uh, the way some of the words were formed, uh, the letters were formed. Robert Ressler, a former FBI profiler, has compiled a behavioral profile of the person who wrote the note. In my opinion, the person that wrote this note is, uh, is college educated. They're articulate, they're bright, they're worldly, and they're female. Uh, I think it's a mature female. Police don't believe John Ramsey wrote the note, but they have not eliminated Patsy. So they're looking closely at other writing samples, especially those written by Patsy. For example, the phrase, and hence, in the ransom note, is the exact same phrase used in a Ramsey family Christmas message. Jean Bonnet's injuries are also key to the investigation as to who might have killed her. What caused the severe head injury that rendered Jean Bonnet helpless? Medical examiner Ron Wright believes the injury did not come from a sharp object. The skin was not lacerated or torn. If you hit somebody with something like a two by four or a hammer or a flashlight, it tears the skin. This has to be something flat. Wright believes Jean Benet's head could have been smashed against a wall, either by accident or by force. And there is more forensic evidence police are still reviewing that has recently come to light. The coroner found fibers on her body. They were blue, like blue lint, little pillings, and they found them in her vaginal area. Her body had been wiped down. So where did those fibers come from? Police investigators looking to find a match for the fibers have examined evidence from a number of people connected to this case. They recently received clothing the Ramseys were reportedly wearing on Christmas Day. Scientists in this Colorado Bureau of Investigation lab use special lights to look for the tiniest fibers that might match those found on Jean Bonnet. Different body fluids fluoresce or glow under these different wavelengths of light. The autopsy report also revealed that Jean Bonnet had eaten pineapple on Christmas Day, a simple fact that may now be a key to solving this case. I'm hearing that there was no pineapple at any of the parties the Ramseys attended. When did the child eat the pineapple? Did the Ramseys lie to the police when they said they put her right to bed? Did they actually go down and get her a snack and give her a pineapple? And, and if so, then why did they lie? The pineapple could be an important clue. Because the investigation has taken so long, and because the Ramseys publicly don't appear to be cooperating with police, even some of their closest friends and staunchest supporters are starting to wonder. I really feel that this murder has divided the friends up into virtually two different camps. Judith Phillips had been a close friend of Patsy Ramsey for 14 years. Their families even moved to Boulder from Atlanta about the same time. Last March, she was informed the Ramseys no longer wanted to have anything to do with her. How they've treated me um, has given me insight into where they are right at this particular moment. I believe that there has been more effort made in the cover-up following the murder than the murder itself. I think something terrible happened in that house, and I feel that those individuals, Patsy and John, have an insight as to what happened. Fleet White Jr., who was with John when John Bonet's body was found, recently wrote an editorial calling for a special prosecutor to be appointed in the case. He criticized prosecutors, saying, among other things, there is a strong impression that the Boulder County District Attorney has acted improperly because, he says, prosecutors shared evidence with Ramsey attorneys. He even asked Colorado Governor Roy Romer to intervene. Romer refused to step in. But the editorial is said to be a strong indication that White no longer supports the Ramseys. Linda Hoffman, who cleaned house for the Ramseys three days a week, still stands by them. John and Patsy didn't have anything to do with killing my little girl. Um, and if they did, if it's proven that they did, I'll never trust anybody the rest of my life because I've never seen anything but a loving, kind, wonderful family.
Other people who were close to the Ramses agree, including Pam Griffin, who made some of Jean Bonnet's pageant costumes. Anyone who knew her could never have harmed her. That's why I feel it must be someone uh, you know, who was not within the family or who did not know her. Griffin's daughter befriended Jean Bonnet. She helped teach Jean Bonnet dance steps and even babysat for her. I'd pretty much grown out of babysitting, but I never passed up an opportunity to spend time with her. She kept a smile on my face. What happened to this precious little princess, the six-year-old who wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps as a beauty queen? People close to the case tell me that they believe someone inside the family did this. The police know who killed this child. Boulder police are still painstakingly piecing together the elusive evidence they think will prove who killed Jean Bonnet Ramsey. So what really happened in the Ramsey home on Christmas night? Well, here in San Francisco, the city has been playing host to a conference of the best forensic scientists in the world. When we come back, we'll give you their unique perspective on this unique case. Up next, at a conference dealing with death. Oh, you have a full wall-mounted autopsy facility. The experts duke it out over what yeah, happened to Jean Benet. It's, it's the most complex. Come on. It's really all they have. The guy that came in from the outside and killed her forgot to bring tape. Many people believe it. the Ramseys, you're thinking to yourself, should I entrust to the police that they will do the right thing? The person that's going to mash somebody in the head and cause this awful blow, put a garage around the neck and strangle, probably would have been in a frenzy. I think that this is one of the most botched investigations. The footprints, the miscellaneous uh, handprint we're hearing about now, the fibers, these are all coming from neighbors who called the press and said, hey, the police just called and asked me, you know, was I in the basement? Last week, San Francisco hosted a conference of the world's top forensic scientists and detectives. And the talk of that conference was the Jean Benet Ramsey case. A few minutes ago, we showed you the latest developments in that case. And now we're going to go inside the conference to listen in on the experts to see if they can spot anything the police missed. I would like to officially welcome you to the golden anniversary meeting of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And I thank you all for coming to San Francisco for this meeting. Shot. He has what looks to be just a classic gunshot wound yes. inside of his head. And amazingly, some of these bodies are preserved. Amazingly preserved. Into a blood stain, analysts. It's absolutely amazing, particularly with the Lewinsky case and all that. We don't let assholes upset us. Just another wiener head that wants it his way on the jury. We need a contract now, Dave. Right, I know. Well, you have a full wall mounted. Autopsy facility with a, uh, an autopsy cart. Look, he didn't survive the uh, car accident, so we're going to bio-seal him. This is the CrimeScope forensic light source. We're here this to sell lots of products to DNA <laughs> scientists. Welcome to the cafe. May I help you? At the time of death was some, somewhere probably November of 89. Right. Well, they find a woman in 1995 still in the house. Oh, God. About 55 pounds of bones. What do you have here? I'll tell you what you have. You have a person who is dead, John Benet Ramsey. And as we sit here, to my knowledge, some 14 months later, there's nothing of a definitive nature, any forensic evidence, that would place someone else at the scene. It's a staged crime. It's of a course. staged event. Right. Well, you, well look at the note. Yeah. I mean, the note, the note is, is an obvious exactly. stage. That is not... When, when you consider, I mean, consider, all this, yeah, no, consider all this that takes place. That we've just if you sit down and write that and note, then, which was written okay. in left hand, by the way, yeah. if you sit down and write that thing with your left hand, two and a half pages, yeah. single space like that, yeah. doing this, if yeah. you're right-handed, I tell you what, first of all, your hand gets tired it after a page, but it takes at least, this thing takes 35 minutes to write out. 
just sitting oh, right sure. out. Of course. That's a long time. Besides the fact that there's a lot into it as far as ideas and and oh, it's, and, it's, it's and it's the most some complex. of money, the yeah, SBTC, two big banks. It's big the most complex. Come on, it's complex really all they have. Involved ransom and, notes. And, and where's the paper come from? Yeah. The, the paper was yeah. in the house, right? It comes from an notepad from, that was in right the house. There. In fact, the, the way it was found... The, the, the guy that came in from the outside that killed her forgot to bring paper. Yeah. And he forgot when he wrote the ransom yeah. note, hey, she's already dead downstairs yeah. Yeah. in the basement. That's a bad ethnic joke. And the Sharpie yeah, pen it was written with was also found inside the home. Mm -hmm. The FBI mm -hmm. did, but aren't did you also figure that out. But aren't you also trying to put some rationality on what we all agree is a crazy, sadistic <laughs> event? You know, I mean, no, you, know, no, no. You, you know, you sit here and you try right. to, you know, analyze Criminal patterns. It. Criminal patterns is what we're looking at here. And when you're seeing them, when they fly in the face of each other, you see criminal patterns that are consistent. Uh, when you see dynamics flying in the face of each other and conflicting, it, it tells you something's greatly wrong here. Well, and, I mean, no doubt a simple formula. Then put up a simple formula. Note at the house, Mrs. Ramsey finds it 5 a.m. in the morning, 5 30 in the morning. The child shouldn't have been there. It's a ransom note. Tell me this. Why, the were, there no, the why were there no prints on that note? Now, that's strange. Huh? Someone wore gloves. I don't know that, you know. But yeah, the, well, if you wear How can there be no prints? Yeah. No prints. Let me finish my point. Where did you wear gloves? I think it's important because it, it tells the whole story. The notes in the house found at 5.30 in the morning by Mr. Ramsey, the child shouldn't have been there. The child's in the basement dead. You shouldn't find a note. When the note and the child are dead, these are these conflicting things. Uh, you don't write a ransom note saying get $118,000 when you kill the kid and leave her in the basement. Leave her in the basement. This person would have to be psychotic to do something like that. But if he was psychotic, he couldn't enter the house, go into the house, go to the second floor, get the child, bring her probably down that spiral staircase, bring her down to the first level, bring her down to the second level, kill her, go back up and get some paper, go back well, down and write the note, think... go back up to the second level and leave the note and leave. How long is that going to take you? Well, I don't know. I and a psychotic just... person... Yeah. Well, it's not going to be that old. You know, might have been psychotic when he did a whole lot of very involved. He was things. he was suffering from a very specific type of psychosis. Yeah. That's paranoia, where you regain a lot of your intellect. Well, 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 but whatever. I mean, you know, all I'm saying is, is that we're talking about trying to create a crystal right. ball, mm -hmm. and I don't know that you know, Cyril got an explanation. You got an ex explanation, Cal. What have you heard about you know different theories? The theories of the of the um... well, there are three. There's 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 one that uh, that the father did it. The mother was an accomplice. There's one the mother did it. The father was an accomplice. And there is the intruder theory. And we've and got like five that? different Isn't intruders. That by some that, people, by well, some people. you look at the different that, that kinds the, of intruders the, they've thrown out. The that the brother, the nine-year-old brother. brother. I'm just, just, just but the brother is really a witness. People, I'm not saying it's my, Many my people theory. believe the brother had something and to do which, with it, which, but he's an important witness. Which in does explain, from from one perspective, why the mother and father uh, would stick together like this and would look anybody in the eye and the cameras and uh, your cameras or somebody else's and say, you know, I did not kill my child. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean that they're telling the truth, but I'm saying it, you know, it's one psychological explanation for their ability uh, to do that. Well, we actually did work on the Rodney King case where they analyzed the videotape, looked at, uh, did some testing on baton strikes, how much force it takes, it would take, you know, an officer to, and they strike a person. I found particles as small as a flea leg. <laughs> Frank goes, yeah, and a flea's me. <laughs> when you want to identify people and, you know, you go to the OJ trial where they're trying to, to find a, a DNA marker and, and identify a person by their, by their actual DNA structure. We talk about the fact that there was no DNA found from the outside, from outside the family, but there was some under her fingernails. Oh. I think what police are looking at now and pathologists are talking about and agreeing and disagreeing over is the DNA which was under her fingernails was cracked and hardened. It was old DNA. It was not hunks of skin that she got from fighting off an attacker. So that DNA under her fingernails is not going to prove anything. No, that's that's right. Right. The family right. wouldn't right. know. Right. That's not, so we're that's still not down to the no outside I, DNA I, I and no I, I have it from pretty reliable sources. That there is no DNA no. evidence mm -hmm. that is being reviewed, at least by the DNA experts. What would what would DNA under the fingernails? What would hairs and fibers? I mean, exactly. well, fibers in the house. Fi you're, but you're, fibers that they, you know, supposedly yeah. they have fibers. What would a defense attorney say about that? They live there. No, but I don't care where those fibers are found. Even even in her vaginal area. Well, that's what supposedly is found. But they can still explain it away. What happens if, it, if, it, if it's matter. fiber that doesn't come from the Ramsey's house? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, okay. That if, it, if it's That's in the good. vaginal area, then indeed that yeah. would be significant. And, but and this is what I keep on coming back to. Listen to all the different ways mm -hmm. that we can, and when we discuss this case, oh yeah, that it could go that way, it could go that way. But what we've seen thus far, we're talking about.
if you don't have anything to hide, why are you trying to hide anything? Exactly. But if your child had been brutally murdered, would you indeed be willing to subject yourself to this media circus and to all these things, especially if you were had the financial needs to separate yourself from that? Yeah, but the fine stress has got to be pretty tough. No, I think it was, just, it. it was just one of the parents, and eventually the other one would give in. Would figure it out. Yeah. And if it's both, then one of them is going to make a slip. We, most of these discussions and, and debates and differences of opinion, I think, have centered around the fact, yes, Ramsey's, no Ramsey's. The right. issue may well be which Ramsey. A jury, ultimately, will determine whether with reasonable medical certainty, whether or not there is any evidence there from another person. The Ramseys, then, as defendants in a trial, will have every right to convince the jury that they did not do it. Well, that's not what we do in America, okay? What we do in America is have a government that says, I believe that I have evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's when I bring the case. Not, you know, not let's throw it out for a jury to decide and see if the Ramseys, if we bring them into court, can prove otherwise. They did allow us to do some DNA analysis. It's clear the color changed. There must be a chemical reason for it. No that. embalming. God, if you got to understand. I get no that. embalming. Been real, no embalming. It's really good. Everybody thinks to know you. you well, know, yeah, you know well, you. yeah. They act like it was they do it wrong. And I thank you all for coming to San Francisco for this meeting. Let me tell you something. I'm also the parent of a murdered child, and I know exactly what the Ramseys are going through because I've walked in their shoes. But it seems as though a wedge has been driven between the police, the Ramseys, and the DA's office. That can't be. As tough as it is, the Ramseys have got to work with the police. And the police have to cooperate and work with the DA's office. You've got to remember, there's a child killer still out there. And the only way to resolve this is by cooperation. This is the way to get justice and so little Jean Bonnet can rest in peace. Up next, from fighting on the field to the fight of his life. This is some real something that, that is hard. It's, it's with me every day. Charles Haley wants to know if you're the one person in a million who can save his daughter's life. Now, you can run, but you can't hide, even in cyberspace. Join us on our website to learn more about the fugitives, our missing children, and how to fight back against crime. And when a capture goes down, you'll be the first to know. It's www.amw.com, where America fights back online. This next story is very different for us. We heard about an event just across the bay in Oakland where a little girl is fighting for her life. Well, tonight, we want to put the power of our partnership behind that fight. For this story, we're not going to ask you to spot a fugitive or find a missing child. All that really matters is that you care, because tonight, anybody can make that call and be a hero. Charles Haley is one of the best defensive ends in NFL history. He's the only player to win five Super Bowl rings. I play the game with all my heart, and, you know, and that's, that's me. That's how I play the game. But Charles is taking on a new challenge, not against the football opponent, but against his daughter's cancer. It all started last year when Charles and his wife, Karen, brought three-year-old Brianna to the doctor with stomach pain. I knew she was sick, but we never, ever thought it would be something like leukemia. She's had chemotherapy and radiation treatments, making her lose her hair and put on weight. She's in remission now. But for Brianna to survive long term, she's going to need a bone marrow transplant. They instantly checked the, uh, her blood against the bone marrow um, donors that it, in the past, and uh, they checked the family, and we didn't match. Brianna's chances are dim without a direct marrow match, and the chances of finding one are even slimmer. One in a million. They said a chance of one in a million. So, you know, in my mind, I said, well, I'm going to get a million people telling me. That's when Charles Haley started his new career as Crusader. 
taking the drive and intensity of one of the best football players and putting it to a new use. I'm right there. Brianna, come here. Come stand right here. Come stand in front of Daddy. And Charles is assembling a dream team of superstars to help him out. Athletes like Joe Montana, Ronnie Lott, and baseball's Barry Bond. We need to pull together and get everyone together, especially African Americans, to become registered donors to save our lives. Bone marrow matches usually come from people of the same race, and only 7% of people on the donor registry are African American. A lot of African Americans don't realize how many people are being uh, being neglected and not being able to be helped because they're not going out giving blood. So Charles and his team are out to change that, organizing registration drives around the country, enlisting help from whoever they can. I mean, if I can do anything to help people, you know, take the test to maybe be a match to save a life, I'll do it. They haven't found a match yet, but for Brianna's sake, Charles will continue to fight the greatest struggle of his life. Football battles, the pain, the surgeries, you know, the heartache, the, you know, it, it came and go because it's, it's part of the game, and I understood that, but this is real. The best way we can all help is to get ourselves on the bone marrow donor registry. It's a simple process. You fill out a few forms and give just two tablespoons of blood. So I want everyone watching to get involved because this is a case where you really can make a difference. If you want information on how to get on the bone marrow registry, give us a call on our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Goodbye. Bye-bye. There are thousands of people with life-threatening diseases just waiting for a bone marrow match. And every time somebody registers, their chances of survival go up. Now, I want you to remember that finding out if you can be a donor is virtually painless. It's as simple as giving a little bit of blood. And back in our crime center, representatives from the National Bone Marrow Program are just waiting for you to make that call and tell you how you can help. So please, do it. You could save a life. Now, there's another child that desperately needs your help. Police in Pasadena, California are searching for 12-year-old Olga Mendez. They say she was kidnapped by her mother's former boyfriend, Gustavo Angulano Mesa. On February 6th, Mesa took the child from school and fled. Police believe they could be in the San Francisco area. Olga was last seen wearing a white and purple shirt, black pants, and white tennis shoes. If you've seen Olga Mendez or Gustavo Angulano Mesa, please call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Police in Salinas, California say 37-year-old Jim Klein was killed by a hit-and-run driver while riding his bike on November 7th. Call if you know anything about this case. Join the manhunt with Manhunter, the official magazine of America's Most Wanted. A one-year subscription is just $19.95. And wear what the AMW team's wearing. Order your own America's Most Wanted t-shirts, hats, jackets, and coffee mugs. For the magazine or the AMW products, call 1-800-AMW-9044. Now, here's a quick review of tonight's cases. Tony Amati is wanted for three murders in Las Vegas. Investigators are still looking for anyone with information about the death of six-year-old Jean Benet Ramsey. And federal agents are looking for Eric Robert Rudolph. Rudolph's a suspect in the bombing of a Birmingham abortion clinic. Now, as we've been telling you for the last few weeks, we've hit our 500th capture. And next Saturday, we're going to have a spectacular show celebrating that milestone. A look back at 10 years of putting away the bad guys. You'll see the celebration. Thank God, Jesse. <laughs> and the revelation. Yes, yes, that's him. It's just one of those moments where you just can't believe what your eyes are seeing. The faces.